Welcome to today's episode of The Hub by Built Environment ME. I'm Marisha Singh, the editor of the magazine, and today we're diving into the world of real estate technology with a focus on MRI software. For our listeners, we've got James Massey, the managing director of MRI software in studio with us in Dubai. He's going to talk to us about his suite of products and a lot more. So the first question to you, Mr. Massey from us is, with the proliferation of sensors and data points in modern buildings, how does MRI software assist organizations in filtering and prioritizing this data? Great, great question. Good morning as well. Um, it, IoT sensors have been around for many, many years. And the, and the question is, what value do they bring to, to a business? And how can we help businesses leverage value from those particular sensors? If we look at our, our office in London, um, which you're more than welcome to attend, is uh, we have energy sensors, we have footfall sensors, we have desk occupancy sensors, we have air quality sensors. Uh, the entire building, of course, is flooded with those, those particular assets. And actually, what we try to draw from that, though, is value. So we're saying, for example, this area is uh, under-occupied. It is using too much energy. It is maybe uh, you know, the desk, for example, are, are not being utilized. We ultimately try to draw value from that. So we do like a dynamic building management. So we basically close down certain areas of our building uh, on certain days when they're underoccupied because our sensors have told us those particular points. If we look at how that spanned into wider business, people want to understand how an asset is performing. So if we look at, for example, an energy monitor, if we put that on a, on a HVAC unit, for argument's sake, we can, we can understand how its energy performance is, is operating over a period of time. So it operates kind of in an envelope. If it goes outside of that envelope, we know that something's going to go wrong. So you know, if we start to look at prediction, IoT sensors can help us then to, uh, to understand how an asset may start to fail, how it may not be performing optimally. You know, we may be looking at a fridge unit in a, in a hospital, for example, and if that temperature goes outside of its operating model, that then becomes a problem. How do we then look to that to, to get that quickly? Um, IoT creates a huge amount of data, though, and, that, and I think that's one point that people must understand with IoT is the data it creates is vast. The reality is you need a very, very, very small part of that data to actually be actionable. And we'll come to the conversation later on around how we can leverage some of those particular points. So I think IoT has been around for many years. I think now it's becoming more and more consumer orientated. You know, it's, it's, it's in the fabric. You know, your, your, your business is a smart built environment. Why, why is that? Because, because businesses now, products now, uh, assets now, new homes, et cetera, new assets, all now have these sensors now in the, in the fabric of those points. So I think it's a great opportunity to, to give a wider understanding about how something's performing um, the issue, of course, that creates then is someone has to then monitor that. And what does that really mean? If you start to get more and more and more data from IoT, you have to do something with it, which then becomes a problem. That's what we're going to come to in the, in the conversation. Amazing. That's a great insight into what's been happening so far. And then you have this huge disruptor called AI, and it's everywhere. So what is AI and how does it fit into this huge flood of data that comes in? A AI is... Um, is, is a great, it's, it's a phenomenal technology, you know, and if we look at its its potential, I think it's limitless in all honesty. You know, the, the potential of AI to do more things quicker, better, more efficiently is, is of course, is there. However, there, of course, there's risks with anything at all. And every time we look at ChatGPT or, or Gemini or any of those platforms, they always say at the very bottom, results may not be accurate. Which I think is very, very, very critical to understand those things. There. These things may not be accurate. They, they only know what they know. And I, th and I think it's really, really important that people understand that AI is... Is it only knows what it knows. It only knows what it's told. And again, you know, data validation, and we'll come to that in the conversation. Data validation, I think, is absolutely critical. You know, IoT. How can we draw value from those sensors? You know, if you say to to Grok or Gemini or or, or um, Copilot, you know, what what are you seeing here? What is this telling me here? What this is telling me now is this building is too hot because it's over occupied. Okay, what is it telling you now? You know, those things I think are absolutely critical to draw valuable insights from that but it's about the data and the criticality is I think the systems of records um, are, are so, so, so now more important than ever because everyone says we have an AI strategy, but ultimately before that, there are several layers before that. Uh, you know, I think data is one of those critical, those critical points and, and IOT sensors, smart sensors, smart buildings, et cetera, create a data feed that must be governed. You must control that data feed there to make sure there's value in it. And would you recommend uh, or say that you can't work without AI when it comes to optimizing asset life cycles? I think if I think the world now is an AI first world. You know, if I look at Emirates flights, for example, I flew to the flew to Dubai 
uh, a place I love dealing, of course, uh, on an Emirates flight. Emirates online chats mm -hmm. is an AI is an AI engine first before you speak to an individual. Uh, you know, the same with Hilton hotels or the same with any other part. You know, it's it's there. It's a thing now. You know, my 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 uh, my fourteen year old daughter is learning about AI at school now. Like it, it's 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 part of the fabric. So I think everyone must have a good. Uh, everyone must have an AI strategy, but it's about the responsibility of what that means. You know, I don't think. I don't think it's quite as easy as saying we take these people and replace them with an AI engine. I, I don't think that is actually the case because I think the compliance and the responsibility in our vertical around facilities management, building managers, etc., is so important. Could you or would you or should you trust an AI engine to do that? I think the risk is 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 is, is, is as of yet undefined. Uh, I think it's really important to do that. So I think AI is absolutely a thing. MRI software, of course, we have an ATI um, a strategy across our business. You know, we, we believe in interoperability of systems. We believe in data validation at points of entry. We believe in all those things. That it's in our DNA of our business that people thrive in a well-connected community. And AI actually overarches those particular points. But what underpins it? And, and that's the criticality of what underpins it as a robust system of record uh, or systems of record, maybe the plural of it. That's the critical point. And because we're talking about what underpins it, could you tell me what MRI Agora is? So MRI Agora, so the, the word Agora, uh, you should look at this. It's, it's, it's a Greek word for a meeting place. That's, what, that's basically what it means. Uh, it's that place where people come together to meet, to interact, to trade uh, back in ancient times. And what we, and I got to say to the previous sentence there, is people believe, uh, we believe that people thrive in a well-connected community, uh, be that people, members of the public, or be that systems, or be that our staff, etc. So MRI Agora is the meeting place of all our data sets. It's the place where we bring together all of our systems. We have some, we have huge amounts of IT solutions, of course, globally, but also there are huge amounts of competitors as well. And actually Agora is the place where we bring together all those data sets. We, we do not believe in, in data isolation. We think data isolation um, breeds risk. You know, how can we have... 10 systems and only six of them talk, four of them don't talk, and then those four then don't talk to each other. It doesn't make any sense. So people must interact People must interact with systems correctly. We must be very, very clear of those particular points. And actually, MRI Agora is the solution that we that we built from the ground up. Uh, principally, it is, it, is, it is a multitude of things. First of it is our integration architecture. So it's what connects all of our solutions together. So if you have uh, if you have MRI Evolution, maybe PMX, maybe uh, 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 MCI, maybe Engage, it's a thing that connects them all together. So that's the first point there. So interoperability layer. It is our it is our cloud first solution. So everything, of course, by MRI is, okay. is hosted in the cloud. Uh, we have we have hosting in the UAE. We have hosting globally in, in all various places. When it becomes into KSA as well, of course, obviously in KSA when that becomes available into uh, uh, to Azure. Um, but critically, so it's our it's our integration layer. It's our cloud platform which is secured, managed, etc. Uh, and then and then a business intelligence level. So if we look at how. How do we then get people then to leverage value then from our data? You know, we look at things like Power BI, we look at NLP, so natural language processors, we look at all those particular points. That's what that does. So Agora is is not only connection security platform, it's also that data lake framework. It's it's what we then sit our AI engine over the top of. So we have a we have a principle called Ask Agora. So Ask Agora is basically Hi, Agora, um, I'm looking for what is my average turnover rent or how many times have I been out to service a Panasonic HVAC unit or how many times has this particular tenant called me, for example, just random examples there. Mm -hmm. That is what we now do. So you have like an English version of, of asking that particular question. But also we take it slightly further than that then. So we look at our this particular region, for example, we look at multilingualness. What can we do with multilingual? You know, we have some great provisions here, which, which we've talked about before, uh, you know, in terms of... Uh, uh, a person's relevant language. What is their spoken language? How can we take them? Maybe their first spoken language is uh, Urdu, for example. Maybe we then say, right, actually, let's make the system operate in Urdu um, using a Gorian to be able to do it. So they can talk to the device in Urdu in their own spoken language. We then tr translate them through MRI Gora back into English, into the system, and then back the opposite way as well into their own language. So make the system as friendly as possible because, as we said before, if everybody can't interact with the system, that breeds risk, and we shouldn't do that. Amazing. So I have two follow-up questions, actually. So from the way you've described Agora, it's for everybody, isn't it? It's not just for the decision makers. I, I think 
Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so Agora is for everybody because ultimately everybody needs to have information. Data, data is great, but who wants to look through spreadsheet and spreadsheet and spreadsheet? No one wants to do that anymore. That, that, those days are well gone. So it doesn't matter whether you're a CEO or a, an ops director or a facilities person. It doesn't really make a difference who you are. Agora is the framework and the answer for you because ultimately you need your information at your fingertips. That's what that brings to the to the party. And because we've talked so much about the data points, uh, what challenges are involved in ensuring data consistency and reliability? We we gather so much information on a daily basis. Where we're sat now, you know, we're recording on multiple cameras. There's there's cameras outside. You know, all the time, data is being recorded globally. The, the statistics are phenomenal. How many petabytes of data every single day are collected? The criticality though is, what is the value in that data, and how do we know that that's valid and up to date? So we we look at validation at point of entry, and this is really important because point of entry used to be me or you sat with a keyboard typing into a system and through a graphical user interface. Those days are long gone. You're, yeah. That that is still a point, but it's not the only point anymore you know an iot sensor an energy monitor a uh, an online um, an online framework a twitter feed or an x feed uh you know those things now are all now points of entry they're all now data validation points so i think what's important is we gather uh so much information every single day but validation is critical you know the engines that we run all of our data through have to be robust because otherwise we're putting low quality or unvalid data into a system and then if we then roll back then to what ai then looks like ai of course only knows what it knows mm -hmm. so we, we must ensure it's valid at the point of entry we must also make sure that it's up to date as well so you know if we if we have someone's phone number how do we know that that's still valid if we have someone's email address, how do we know that's still valid mm -hmm. if we have um a um maybe like a finance record from 10 years ago do we still need to know those things mm -hmm. so i think archiving data management is critical and business is now it, it's it's a thing isn't it you know data management is now its own stream of a, of a business because ultimately people have gathered so much information in the last 20, 30, 40 years, they have to now be able to leverage value from it. So uh, it's, re it's a huge responsibility to make sure that that's, that that's right. And because you've talked about data management, I know that, you know, it's very easy to say we've got a data strategy, we've got an AI strategy, etc. What does it really mean to have an AI strategy versus a data strategy? I think one comes before the other. So I don't, I don't think you can have, if I know you can't have an AI strategy without a data management strategy. And, you know, a data management strategy is what we've just said there. You, you must make sure that you are gathering just enough information. It's the kind of Goldilocks style, you know, just just enough data okay. to be able to make value from it. Don't, don't collect too little, too much, mm -hmm. because there's no point in terms of those that, that particular point. And, and those businesses that have a good, robust data management strategy are the ones that will then get a good AI strategy. And if, if we go back a level, actually, I think critical AI strategy should start way before then. You should start with leadership. So ultimately, what is the value to the business of having an AI strategy? and the data management strategy as well, actually. So we must start at the very beginning there. So you should start with leadership. And I think people people who've deployed this well is led from the top. It's led from the CEOs and, and the board, et cetera, because ultimately people see scare stories in the news. They see, oh, jobs replaced by AI, et cetera. Ultimately, there is a reason for that somewhere. So I think the boardroom must communicate down to the people why they're doing it. So that's the first point, leadership. The second point then is around security. You know, what is the risk in terms of exposing your data to, to an AI engine? Is there, what is there or is there risk in terms of doing that? So I think critically, you must ensure that there is a security model built into that particular construct, which I think is great because we've got leadership, we then have security. Third one, then we have data management. So I've talked now already in this conversation and prior to this there, because AI engines only understand what they know, Mm -hmm. And we must make sure what they know is relevant and, and correct, obviously. And then we then come then to AI. So, so I think that's if we go, so in my head, AI is always probably fourth, maybe fifth in the list. So leadership, security, data, AI. Um, because actually, the, if you did it another way, how does it work? If you say we have, we, are, we, we have AI first, how does that work? Because what, what does it know? It what it knows may not well be accurate. Okay, absolutely. So basically, good data in, underpins a good AI strategy. Good data underpins everything, doesn't it? You know, if you th if you consider it, and I think I think if you don't have a good data management strategy, and your and your users and consumers don't understand the value in that data management, uh, it, it it just doesn't work. work. You you must make sure everyone's on the journey. Change is difficult, isn't it? You know, people people human beings generally don't like change because people like consistency. I think 
communication, over communication, take people on the journey to the reason why this is so important. You know, if we if we said now tomorrow we're going to replace all of your jobs with an AI engine, people are going to start become panicky, you know, and, and they sort of communicate that outwards there. What is important though is to tell people the reasons why, but also what more can they do in their jobs. So if we said we could replace this mundane task of typing in all these invoices with an AI engine, that's great. And now what that means is that you can now do all these other value add things to the business. So I think people should see AI and, and anything around robotic process automation, which has been around for many years now, as an, as an enabler to enable them to do more value add things to the business. Because actually people go, actually, do you know what? I've not got to type in all those invoices anymore manually. I've not got to do these things anymore. I can now focus now on speaking to our customers or I can focus on you know, some, some other value add thing. That I think is the key point. But communication is key. Those businesses that have an AI strategy, great but communicate that to the team. You know, take the team on the journey. You know, I'm going to go back to the beginning there. We start with leadership. The leadership must communicate the reasons why we do these particular points because if people just hearsay causes fear and fear then doesn't doesn't breed success. What breeds success? There's people going, oh my God, I've now got 20% more of my time now because I'm not going to do these things now and now I can speak to my tenants or my residents or I can now you know, maybe train the people more. I can do all these other things now because AI and, and RPA has taken that over. Okay, amazing. And because you've got so much insight into so many critical assets across the world, um, what do you see in the future as a disruptor or a trend that will move the industry further? You're right. We're, you know, we're, we're so lucky to be the custodians of so many wonderful assets. Uh, and we talked about this before we before this interview. Um, AI, of course, we've, we've discussed that now many, many times, this conversation there. But I think people are... People are more digitization, I think, of services. You know, we live in a world now of, of constantly on 20, 24 7, 365. You know, we're, we're sat in this podcast studio now in, in Dubai, one of the most connected cities probably in the world. People expect that always on service. People expect that Uber style service now, Monday to Friday, nine to five. Uh, is now gone, or Monday to Thursday in the in, in other areas, uh, is, is now gone. People expect things to be highly available. People, therefore, the normal the normal construct of management doesn't exist anymore. You know, the, the the remote working principle. You know, and we discussed that in the in the prelude to this, is there now all the time. People now work from home. You know, and I think how does that govern then what we do then in terms of technology? Because you know, pe people no longer go to the office Monday to Friday. You know, they they just don't, they, they, and they don't operate in a normal time manner either. So I think more digitization of services. People expect a high availability. I want my you know, insert name of request at 3 a.m. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. we, we need to make sure we can do that. IT has spent many years working in that Monday to Friday, 9 till 5. It's now had to catch up. Cybersecurity, you know, we see, the, we see the news stories certainly back in the UK of people who've been victims of cybersecurity uh, uh, attacks, you know. Uh, and I think what's important there is being being confident that your systems, whilst digitally available, must also be secure as well. Um, so I think I think digitization of services, AI, IoT, more information from the data that we hold upon the systems is, is key. Um, and I think people are pushing more and being more cognizant around, around compliancy. Uh, you know, that kind of golden thread of, are we a compliant business? You know, and again, we talked in the prelude to this, but, you know, are, are, are our assets compliant? Are we compliant as a business? Where's the risk mitigation? What's the risk profile of our organization look like? So uh, I think there's some great stuff to come. Um, you know, I think this, this region pushes technology providers, which I think is a great, great, great place to be. You know, and the more interaction, the more conversation we can have, the better our, our solutions can become. That was an amazing conversation, Mr. Massey, I must say. A lot of insights and a lot of takeaways for our listeners. And I hope to have more such conversations with you in the months ahead. Very welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Built Environment.